All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. We're continuing concepts and principles with B14, identify and distinguish between stimulus and response generalization. We've already talked a little bit about generalization, which is a pretty easy concept to understand. It's when untrained behaviors or taught behaviors or taught stimuli start to evoke responses or we start to see those responses in untrained settings. In other words, if we're teaching someone how to greet somebody in a clinical setting, we want that greeting to occur outside of that setting. We also want that greeting to occur across multiple people, and we want that greeting to change. So when we talk about stimulus and response generalization, it's just an expansion on the idea of what we already understand about generalization. In this case, stimulus and response generalization just occurs to the multiple stimuli that might be generalized across or the multiple responses that start to appear as a result of generalization. So it can be an intimidating concept at first just to wrap your head around what exactly stimulus and response generalization are. But as always, we're going to break it down into digestible ideas that we think are going to help you pass your exam and become a better practitioner. If you want our study materials, be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com. We have practice exams, study guides, and also our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Make sure you like and subscribe for all of our updates. We have three BCBA videos a week. We also post our RBT content as well. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Let's start off with what is generalization. Generalization occurs when relevant behaviors happen under different untrained conditions. So with stimulus and response generalization, we're going to look at both the behaviors and those conditions because generalization can occur across learners, different people, behaviors, time, settings. Anytime we teach something and it goes out in the natural world and it happens there, or that thing that was taught changes slightly, we're starting to look at generalization. And generalization may be the most important thing we're trying to focus on when working with subjects or learners or students or whoever you're working with. If your learner or client is not generalizing, you're not being effective. And you have to be effective as an ABA practitioner. So what do we mean when we say stimulus generalization? We're talking untrained or new stimuli evoke the same response as trained or known stimuli. So when you think stimulus generalization, think multiple stimuli. I'm gonna go more into detail in a second. Now response generalization, you're gonna think multiple responses. We have untrained or novel responses serving the same function occur in the presence of a single stimulus. So let's try to visualize this. If we look at stimulus generalization, stimulus generalization occurs when a learned behavior happens in the presence of a variety of stimuli. So let's look at our example down here. We have multiple stimuli. We have hot Cheetos, we have Skittles, and we have chocolate almonds. All three of those stimuli evoke this response of grabbing a handful. So what's happened is the learner, they see a bowl of chips, they see Skittles, they see a box of chocolate almonds, they see something they can eat, a stimuli evoking something, the, the, the response of grabbing a handful of something to eat, and it's happening across multiple stimuli. So let's say that behavior was taught in the presence of hot Cheetos. And now, once they see other food items, they're starting to grab a handful as well. So the response isn't changing, it's just occurring in the presence of a variety of stimuli. So we have a single behavior generalizing across stimuli typically occurs due to shared features or associations. So Cheetos, Skittles, and chocolate almonds don't necessarily share a bunch of features, but they do fit in the same category of being food. And so when we think about our stimulus classes, right, we have different type of stimulus classes. We have topographical classes, we have functional classes, arbitrary classes, but all these stimuli that are evoking those response are now fitting into that same class. Another example would be a child learns to say dog when showing a picture of a golden retriever. So that's the learned behavior. 
Now, the child says dog when seeing a poodle or German shepherd. So the picture is a stimulus, poodle is a stimulus, German shepherd is a stimulus, and the response is generalizing across all those different stimuli. Now let's look at response generalization, which in a lot of ways is the opposite. We have a learner engaging in untrained but functionally equivalent responses in the presence of a stimulus. We really want those responses to be functionally equivalent. It doesn't make any sense for a bunch of random responses to occur in the presence of a a stimulus if they don't serve a purpose. So let's look at our visual. Your stimulus is a friend. Let's say you taught your learner to say hi to a friend. Let's say now they're saying hello and what's up. They've generalized these responses across this single stimulus. So in response generalization, a single stimulus evokes multiple responses. So you're going to want to ask yourself, am I looking at multiple stimuli in a single response, or am I looking at a single stimulus with multiple responses? Those new responses serve the same function and can rapidly expand a learner's repertoire. Let's say we teach a student to ask for break by saying, can I take a break? Now, if you've worked in a clinical or home setting and you've taught a new skill to somebody, a lot of times what happens is we'll teach the student to ask, can I take a break? And what do they do? They only say, can I take a break every single time? Now, we don't want them to just be a robot and we're not just teaching them to be rote. We want that to start to expand. That's going to expand their repertoire. It's going to give them access to more natural reinforcement. So in this case, the student's taught to ask for a break, and now the student's also saying, I need a minute, can I step away, or uses a break card. So we have the stimulus of needing a break, and now we have all these responses that have generalized and and all achieved the same result. So key takeaways. First, we always plan and train for generalization using generalization strategies. It's number one. We don't hope and wait and wish generalization occurs, right? We train multiple exemplars. We train loosely. We do our case analyses. All these generalization strategies that we know we've got to use. You don't sit around and wait for this to happen. Now, stimulus response generalization allows for more efficient teaching without needing to train every single response or stimulus. Think about our example of stimulus generalization. If you had to teach your client to grab a handful in the presence of every single food item, it'd be impossible. You couldn't do it, right? We just don't have enough time and it's just not a good use of time. So when we generalize or when our client generalizes, it makes us more efficient at teaching. Same with response generalization, which in a lot of ways might be more important because if we're trying to teach hi or a greeting, let's say, there's a million different ways to greet somebody. If we've got to teach a million different greetings, it's not a good use of time. This is why we plan and train for generalization so we can get to the point where response generalization is just occurring naturally. And if you can start to see generalization, both stimulus and response occurring naturally, You're doing a great job at being a practitioner. A lot of times people wonder, how do I know if I'm effective, right? I'm making progress, but how do I really know if I'm effective? If you're seeing generalization, there's a good chance you're doing something right and you're being effective. Okay, it's as easy as that. Don't be intimidated by stimulus and response generalization. Generalization is not an overly difficult idea. When we get into the nitty gritty of stimulus and response generalization, it gets a little bit more complicated. But if you just consider, am I looking at multiple stimuli or multiple responses, then it becomes a lot easier. As always, please subscribe. If you haven't already, it really helps us out. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.